Welcome, I'm Sharon Marcus. This is a very large microphone. I'm the Dean of Humanities here at Columbia University. And I would like to begin by thanking Ambassador Jean Kennedy Smith for establishing this award in her brother's honor. I'm on, yes. I'm honored to welcome you to Columbia University, where we are proud to host tonight's award ceremony for the Kennedy Prize for Drama, inspired by American history. Theater and history, an interesting pair. Theater is ephemeral, history deals with what lasts. Where theater embraces artifice, history aims for truth. But theater and history alike strive to bring written texts to life. Both seek to understand what drives us forward and what holds us back, what defines our present moment, and what connects us to the past. As for Columbia University and theater, well, as the saying goes, we have a history. We are, of course, Columbia University in the city of New York, which has long been the nation's theater capital. Before Ellis Island became an immigrant depot in the 1850s, it housed a theater. A 19th century observer wrote, I question if there be a city in the world of the same size and population which can exhibit a theatrical prosperity equal to New York. Columbia University's English department was co-founded by Brander Matthews, a prominent drama critic, who then President, whom then President Seth Lowe appointed as the first professor of dramatic literature in the United States and whose collection of theater memorabilia continues to grace our magnificent rare book and manuscript collection. Columbia College numbers among our alumni such theatrical luminaries as Oscar Hammerstein II, Richard Rogers, Lawrence Hart, John Kander, Fred Ebb, Terence McNally, Janine Tesori, and of course Tony Kushner. We continue to nurture the production and study of theater through our School of the Arts Theater Program and through our distinguished PhD in theater. As Dean of the Humanities, I work with faculty whose mission is to preserve, expand, and enrich our shared cultural history. That history and our nation's theatrical history include our country's propensity for racial classification and discrimination, for racial expression, as well as racist oppression. So I'd like to offer you a few glimpses of my encounters with that theatrical past that I've made over the years, over a decade of doing research on 19th century theater. Many scholars, including some here at Columbia, have documented the importance of performance, both voluntary and coerced, for African Americans. But it's also important to remember that for centuries, with rare exceptions, African and Asian Americans were not allowed to represent themselves on stage in the United States. White actors in blackface played the main characters in Uncle Tom's Cabin well into the 20th century. Although in 1880, some productions began to advertise so-called colored actors appearing as extras in the plantation scenes. So common were blackface and yellowface white performers playing people of color in Broadway plays that as recently as 1917, a play bill vaunted as an utter novelty, colored actors in colored plays. Our theaters, including those in northern cities, were segregated. Playbills for productions in abolitionist Boston in 1858 listed a separate set of ticket prices for colored people who were allowed only in second tier boxes. An 1873 letter to the editor of the New York Herald by a theater goer who signed himself, quote, black but decent, painfully and painstakingly recounted how in visiting the Booth Theater to see a production of Shakespeare's Richard III, he was shunted from one section of the theater to another reserved for black people. Our greatest playwrights take this painful history and wrestle with its angels and demons. Like the best scholars, they engage in an act of alchemy that conjures up the past and brings it flashing into the present. That act of alchemy reminds us of the truth of William Faulkner's pithy insight that the past is never dead. It's not even past. And it reminds us of the mission that Columbia University shares with theater and we hope with great leaders such as Edward Kennedy. A mission to unearth and understand the past that unites and divides us so that instead of repeating history, we can represent it in ways that help us work together to imagine and make a better future. Thank you. So um, 
that was magnificent, Dean Marcus. Thank you. And uh, uh, welcome to the third annual uh, Edward M. Kennedy uh, Prize um, Ceremony. Uh, we're, we're really, really happy to have you here. Uh, the prize uh, recognizes that theater in the hands of a serious artist is a means of examining, revivifying, uh, and exploring our history and bringing to the collective task of remembering the past in addition to the complexity uh, and depth of historical scholarship, the flashes of collective insight and illumination the special, that's the special contribution of our odd and evanescent and elusive and ambiguous and essential form. Um, this is a really um, uh, particularly meaningful uh, day for me because uh, we're, we're now in our third year uh, we've worked very hard to get to this point. Uh, at three years old, I don't feel like we're absolutely firmly established on the planet, but we're on our way. Um, fifth year, I'll start to feel really that the ground is solid under our feet. But it's been a lot of very hard work. I want to thank uh, a couple of people. Um, uh, foremost for today and for all the work um, uh, leading up today, I want to thank uh, my fellow board member, Mandy Michelle Hackett, who is just, you know, has a Godsend. Um, uh, James Neal, who is the uh, chief librarian at Columbia, who uh, shepherded us into existence, is, uh, has uh, resigned as uh, chief librarian, um, uh, serving as interim uh, librarian is uh, Damon Jaggers, who's been uh, an extraordinary help, and uh, Mimian Morales, who uh, sort of uh, transitions us from James into the future has been uh, absolutely indispensable. Also, Matt Hempel and everybody at Columbia University, I want to thank the entire university community for being such uh, an incredibly welcoming and supportive uh, environment for the prize. Um, I also want to thank uh, all of our 20 nominators. I can't say who they are because it's a top secret uh, so that people don't call them up and beg them uh, to nominate their plays. But uh, some of them have served since the beginning. We rotate a few new ones in every year. Uh, Mandy and I do the work mostly of, uh, of finding these people. And um, uh, uh, they've done an astonishing job every year. Uh, and I think this year is obviously no exception. Um, and then just uh, two more things. Uh, I just want to say on a personal note, because I have to say this, uh, I think that the uh, four plays that, the, that have received the uh, Kennedy Prize have all been extraordinary works. Um, this year, I, uh, I feel like I have to say, uh, the prize is going to a writer who I consider to be uh, not only one of the uh, greatest playwrights this country has produced, but one of the greatest living writers, um, and, uh, and somebody in who, uh, in whom I'm, I'm, uh, of whom I'm genuinely in awe. Um, and I, it makes it feel like it's all worthwhile uh, that this year's recipient is uh, Susan Lori Parks. So I'm just. <laughs> and my, uh, my, last, um, my last thank you, of course, and it'll be this every year until I stop doing this, uh, is, uh, of course, Ambassador Jean Kennedy Smith, uh, who uh, created this prize who got me into this, um, and it's taken years off of my life, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm very glad for those years. Uh, we've now, as I said, made uh, four playwrights uh, a little more solvent, uh, which is a really good thing, and uh, a little happier. Playwrights should never be too happy, because we wouldn't be able to do good work if we were. <laughs> but for at least for tonight, Susan Laurie will be happy, and we're all happy for her, um, and uh, uh, I think that what Jean did in, in honoring uh, her brother uh, for two reasons is, a, is, is an extraordinary thing. One is that she, the, the prize, and we're all really uh, uh, very moved and, and proud of this, uh, honors one of uh, the great legislators in uh, American history, one of our great senators. We've had recent reminders in the news of how not great senators can be. So. <laughs> You know, it's, it's wonderful to have the memory of, of a genuinely great statesman like Ted Kennedy uh, to, uh, to sort of comfort ourselves with when we read about other people who I won't mention. Um, and, uh, um, 
and it's, it's an extraordinary uh, uh, thing uh, that Gene has done for American playwriting. I think uh, in, in highlighting the connection between playwriting and history that Dean Marcus just spoke about so beautifully, uh, in, um, and simply in providing support for playwrights, it's extremely difficult for playwrights to make a living as playwrights uh, these days. Um, and uh, there's nothing more important uh, than supporting newcomers to the field and, uh, and also masters of, of the craft like Susan Lurie. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an extraordinarily generous and beautiful thing and, and Jean and the entire Kennedy family uh, deserve our uh, eternal gratitude. So thank you. So. Uh, on with the program, I'm, I'm just going to explain one thing. Uh, uh, now, I'm going to sit down. Uh, Ted Kennedy Jr. and Patrick Kennedy are going to get up and they're going to talk to you for a little bit. Then there's a, a film uh, that we put together about the life of Edward M. Kennedy. Uh, then, it's not in your program, but uh, each year for the past three years, uh, uh, as you're going to learn from the film and maybe from what uh, his sons are about to tell you, uh, Senator Kennedy, I hope it's okay to say, this was sort of like a musical theater queen, and uh, he really loved musicals. <laughs> so every year, uh, I'm sure he wouldn't mind, I didn't know him, but I'm sure he wouldn't mind my saying that. Um, uh, Gene may have something to say to me afterwards, but he's like, <laughs> Uh, so every year we've had a, a different uh, performer uh, from the musical theater come in and, and perform. And uh, uh, this year the great Tony Award winning uh, Chuck Cooper is going to sing for us and he's going to be accompanied, uh, by, this is after the film, by uh, the extraordinary composer uh, Janine Desorio, also my dear friend. Uh, so thank you for coming. Thank you again, Tony Kushner. Let's give Tony another round of applause. Um, uh, I'm Ted Kennedy Jr. and I just simply want to say thank you um, for, all, for, for all of you uh, to come here tonight, honor my father. Um, I would like to thank the nominators. I want to thank the board. I want to thank Mandy and Tony. Uh, for your steadfast support and your vision for this award. Of course, we wouldn't be here without you, Gene. And no one could have had a better sister than you. And we are, my father was so lucky to have you in life, and he would be so pleased and honored to have an award uh, that re really brings together two things that he loved. He loved public service, uh, he loved history, and he loved the arts. Uh, in fact, when he wasn't in Washington, uh, working on the, the massive amount of legislation uh, and this struggle for social justice and equality and all the things we know about his political legacy, uh, he loved being with artists. He thought that artists were creative, funny, great conversationalists, and just, and you know what? They loved his company too. Um, and I don't think we could think of a greater way to honor my dad uh, than to establish an award like this, to make history come alive. Uh, and to, because my father thought that all of us had a story to tell in our lives. And, and through the arts and the creativity of so many brilliant people here in our country and around the world, um, that is what makes this so special. Uh, so to Susan Laurie and to your mother, Frances, I want to recognize Frances. Thank you so much for coming here tonight and for raising such an amazing daughter. Uh, and we're looking forward to seeing, uh, to seeing all of you in the reception immediately following our, our, uh, our program this evening. And I'll just... Uh, <clears throat> Just echo my brother and say thank you all. And uh, my dad absolutely loved the theater of life. He loved people. When we went out campaigning, he enjoyed the experience of going to different parts of the country to talk to different people and hear about the drama of their life. Because really his job was taking that drama and trying to formulate it into a narrative, which would then become a piece of legislation, which would then hopefully help people in their real lives. So there is a lot of intersection here, and I'm honored to be also at the front row seat, just like I was in his life, to seeing all that he did, to see this drama award come to fruition. And I thank you all for making that possible. Thank you, congratulations. 
That which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. For all those whose cares have been our concern, the work goes on, the cause endures, the hope still lives, and the dream shall never die. the history books when people look back on this century they will say that Edward Kennedy was one of the ablest and most productive most compassionate and most effective men who served in the United States Senate in the entire history of the country my father loved this country and was fascinated by the men and women who helped to shape its history whenever he felt the need to better understand an issue he often looked back to how others had solved similar problems. He loved historical documents and biographies. Their perspective helped him gain understanding, not only of their time, but of our own. Abe Lincoln was a quiet and a melancholy man. But when he spoke of democracy, this is what he said. He said, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this to the extent of the difference is no democracy. Welcome. My grandmother, Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy, gave tours of her home in Hyannisport. Here is a very charming little picture of Ted with his father at the embassy, looking very serious, too. And a wonderful one of the president, late President Roosevelt. Which a tradition my father followed, giving tours of his office. Like Grandma, he could narrate our nation's history from an extraordinary point of view. This is a picture of President William Kennedy and uh, the uh, dog tags that he was wearing in the, uh, in the Pacific. My father wanted to make history come alive. He created the annual family history camping trip. He packed up all of my cousins and took us on trips to visit famous American sites in the company of historians. Uh, Senator Kennedy has been taking his nieces and nephews and many of his family to historic places year after year. It's a wonderful family tradition. It ought to be a family tradition everywhere because those trips can change your life. He took us to Plymouth and the South Shore, the homes of Nathaniel Hawthorne and Herman Melville and the Berkshires, Paul Revere and Longfellow House, the Freedom Trail, the USS Constitution, the Brooklyn Bridge, Harper's Ferry, Manassas, Mount Vernon, Fort McHenry, and a church in Richmond. After Senator Kennedy's most recent visit, where Patrick Henry made his famous speech, uh, Ted nearly tackled me on the Senate floor the next week to tell me about it and how exciting he, it, it was to him and, and to the members of his family. He uh, insists that every child is going to develop a love of history or an understanding, but we sure can do everything we can to give an opportunity for the young people. His love of American history and his place in it is treasured by our family but his contributions to celebrating and preserving our history is his lasting gift to all Americans. My brother, Edward Moore Kennedy, 
was the last of my mother and father's nine children. Right from the start, he captured our attention. My mother had an insatiable interest in history, literature, and the arts, and she taught and quizzed each of us about what she thought was important. Mother required Teddy to memorize the poem, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. She felt that Longfellow's poem was a wonderful way for her children to learn about poetry and history at the same time. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. Teddy always said that early exposure to our nation's history and literature had an immeasurable impact on his life. An avid reader of biographies, he authored his own True Compass, as well as several others, including a children's book and how laws are made, as told through the eyes of his beloved dog, Splash. He admired the visual arts and was an accomplished painter who shared his work with friends and family. Music was perhaps dearest to him, a gift from our grandfather, Honey Fitz, and our mother. Uh, Ted, as you know, sing a sweet Adeline. I used to play for him on this piano. discipline and skill the theater demanded of actors, directors, and writers. He was intrigued by the theater's creation of worlds based on the human imagination, either for the purposes of escaping what's difficult in life or for the purposes of confronting difficult truths. He loved the creative community and the feeling was mutual. He was an ardent student of American history, and of course, he devoted his life to public service. For over 40 years in the United States Senate, he championed the role of the arts, the humanities, and the promotion of our cultural life as integral to the American experience. Teddy could have done anything with his life, and so he chose to do everything. We are all the better for it. some music about daybreak in Alabama and I'm gonna put the prettiest songs in it rising out of the ground like a swamp mist and falling out of heaven like soft do I'm gonna put some tall tall trees in it and the scent of pine needles and the smell of red clay after rain 
and long red necks and poppy colored faces and big brown arms and the field daisy eyes of black and white, black, white, black people. And I'm gonna put black hands and white hands and brown and yellow hands and red clay earth hands in it touching everybody with kind fingers and touching each other natural as do in that dawn of music in that dawn of music when I get to be when I get to be when I get to be a composer and write about daybreak in Alabama Um, I'm deeply honored to be part of the celebration this evening of this year's winner of the Edward M. Kennedy Prize for Drama Inspired by American History. For some 25 years, Susan Laurie Parks has been writing plays that engage American history in ways that don't just fill in some of the gaps in the standard tellings of our national narrative, but that counter counterintuitively perhaps, but urgently, dig more deeply into them and pry them open more widely. This is the playwright, after all, who once set one of her plays, um, to quote the stage directions, in a great hole in the middle of nowhere, an exact replica of the great hole of history. Like the gravedigger in the center of that work, the America play, Parks exhumes what our world wants to forget and lays it bare for us to contemplate and complicate. The word replica is key in that stage direction, as Parks has always been interested in the problem of representation, as a productive problem built into the theatrical art itself, and as a productive problem built into the incomplete experiment of American democracy. Whether in a choral poem about the Middle Passage that fills a darkened stage, in the arcade game of assassinating an Abraham Lincoln look-alike, um, in, this, in, in the dog-eat-dog -dog contest between two scamming brothers, Parks has used dazzling stage metaphors and gorgeous lyrical language to tell stories about individuals struggling within the sweep of time over issues of promises fulfilled or betrayed, faiths kept or rejected, as they narrate themselves into social being. To this astonishing body of work, Parks has now added the masterpiece Father Comes Home from the Wars, parts one, two, and three. Set in 1862 and 1863, the play begins with Hero, a slave, on the brink of a decision over whether to heed his master by assisting him as a soldier in the Confederate Army. Each of the three parts centers on a profound moral conundrum, a choice involving the vexing question of freedom and obligation, and freedom that is never individual, but, also, but that always has social and communal consequences, and the vexing question of the agonizing upheaval of change. Audacious and deeply human, both epic and intimate, 
Father Comes Home is tragic in its dimension, even as it kicks open the closed moral options of that historical form. The first third of a planned nine-part cycle that will move up to the present day, parts one, two, and three already hint at the 21st century in their sly language and in Giovanni's beautiful production, in the costuming and in the gestures, like when Hero uh, describes patrollers searching for runaway slaves. An action that can't help but call to mind Ferguson, Missouri, where we now know for a fact black bodies remain commodities for the building of a local economy. As important, Father Comes Home also looks back to the Western canon, laying, laying claim to it, certainly, but also boldly revising it. Just as the name Edmund Pettus has been overturned, changing from the moniker of a Confederate Army General and Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan into the name of a bridge forever associated with the astonishing bravery of the Selma marchers that President Obama just celebrated a little over a week ago. Parks revamps the old tropes, turns them around, or as she once put it, signifies on the signifying. Her Greek chorus places bets on the outcome of an action. And in the play's breathtaking final section, her Penelope breaks the chains not only of slavery, but of a seemingly all-powerful narrative. In case I've given the false impression at this point that there's anything dour or dusty about Parks' work, uh, let me hasten to add that there's wit and downright hilarity that, uh, in her plays. Um, in Father Comes Home, and, and, and maybe this is a feature in common with the writing of Senator Kennedy, um, there's a talking dog who, despite, uh, bes des despite being played by uh, a human being, um, does in a self-conscious and layered turn what dogs always do in the theater, uh, namely upstage everyone and nearly steal the show. Uh, in this case, um, as a turn, as a Greek messenger, is crucial to any Greek tragedies, but with a shaggy dog story. Just one of the examples of the expert way Parks controls timing, tone, and revelation in Father Comes Home. With great respect for Senator Kennedy and everyone involved in the granting of this important prize, I'd like to tweak its title, uh, the title of the award, a little bit tonight to recognize what I see as one of the essential gifts Susan Laurie Parks' works bring us, namely a view of history as always in process, as she reminds us in a quintessential theatrical way that the past on stage always unfolds in the present. So I'd like to off offer my heartfelt congratulations to Susan Laurie Parks, not just for writing a brilliant play that is inspired by American history, but that itself inspires us to make our own American history. We're going to perform a song from the show, uh, Father Comes Home from the Wars. The song is Misplaced Myself, and it has a little story. Now, back in the day when a slave would run away, his master might say, oh, he's run off, or oh, she's run off. Uh, the master also might say, oh, he's misplaced himself, or she's misplaced herself. And so I just had to write a song about that. trees they be searching on the rivers they be questioning the bees i'm long gone i ain't sitting on your shelf i have misplaced myself i have misplaced myself yeah i ain't working in your field i ain't minding in your store i ain't turning up your butter you don't matter anymore i'm long gone i stole town with all your wealth Trail. I done went and broke my chain. You got everything to lose. I got everything to gain. 
I'm long gone, I ain't sitting on your shelf. I have misplaced myself. I have misplaced myself. I have misplaced myself. I have misplaced myself. Yeah. You a colored man? Yes. I'll be damned. I've seen some before that don't look at he's one of them. Well, I'll be damned. Your colonel, no? Hell no! What's it like carrying a gun, having a regiment? It's an honor. It's a, a big feeling. It's hard to put into words. You can stand up straight when you think about it. That's exactly right. You think you all will beat the Jebs? God willing. And the whole world will change. You'll be able to have your own farm? Or you move up north or anything you want. You really colored? I could pass, yeah. <laughs> Get myself more money, better rank. Plenty like me who can, they do it, but that's not me. My old master, he branded each and every one of us. To tell the world you belong to him? In case we ran off. Did you? Never. Thought about it? Sure, plenty. Boss master, he branded us too, right here. That and lots of other things. What kind of price you fetch these days? I got my freedom handed to me when the master died, but if I remember right, I was worth about the same as you. And freedom might be coming. It'll come. One way or another, it'll come. How much you think we're going to be worth when freedom comes? What kind of price are we going to fetch then? We won't have a price. It's like they don't. That'll be the beauty of it. Where's the beauty of not being worth nothing? Won't be able to be moved around, beaten, bought or sold, forced to work, make men rich while we stay poor. And most soldiers, they're poor, colored and white, both. And there's more to freedom than I can explain, but believe me, it's like living in glory. Who will I belong to? You belong to yourself. So, when a patroller comes up to me when I'm walking down the road to work or to what have you, and a patroller comes up to me and says, whose nigger are you, nigger? I'm going to say, I belong to myself. Today I can say I belong to the colonel. I belong to the colonel, I says now. That's how come they don't beat me. But when freedom comes and they stop me and ask and I say, I'm my own, I'm on my own and I own my own self. You think they'll leave me be? I don't know. <laughs> Seems like the worth of a colored man once he's made free is less than his worth when he's a slave. Is that how come you don't run off? Maybe. I'm worth something so me running off would be like stealing. Well, seems to me you've got a right to steal yourself. Maybe. Maybe not. If you could name yourself anything, what would you be? That's a big question. I don't rightly know. Both of us, satisfied with the names they gave. Huh. And this world is such a mess. How's a colored gonna make his way? Seems like we either get sold off by somebody or sell out our own self. And you could be bought or sold, so could I. That'll end with freedom. What if it don't somehow? Sometimes I get the feeling that the heart of the thing won't change easy or quick. Because the way we were bought and brought over here in the first place, and maybe even with freedom, that mark, huh? That mark of the marketplace, it'll always be on us. So maybe we'll always be twisting and turning ourselves into something that'll bring the best price. And that's the way we were born into this. 
So is it always going to be like that for us? Slavery or not? Freedom or not? Where are we going to get us a better place in the marketplace? You talking like you want to burn something down. I'm just saying. You say you broke? I say you double broke. Snapped in two without a penny to your name, hoping somebody pay more than $800 for you, but God damn it, God willing someday we'll have a place besides just the auction block, and maybe that starts by stealing yourself. Stealing yourself, making yourself like metal on the inside. Maybe it gets better from there. But, I don't know. in his heaven up above up above while we toil bravely down below in the midst of this most fearful day let us count our many blessings in the midst of this bright wilderness, let me see a light I know. In the darkest of the darkest night, there is still a day that comes all right. God is in his heaven, up above, up above, while we toil bravely down below. Keeping on, you know, let us cherish all we carry. When the thick is thin and the plenty ends, oh, it'll be as it has always been. God is in his heaven, up above, up above, while we toil bravely down below. God is in his heaven, up above, up above. While we toil bravely down below Good evening and welcome at the Edward M. Kennedy Prize for Drama inspired by American history is given annually to a new play or musical that enlists theater's power to explore the past of the United States, to participate meaningfully, meaningfully in the great issues of our day through the public conversation grounded in historical understanding that is essential to the functioning of a democracy. If you thought I wrote that, you're out of your mind. <laughs> but you inspired. <laughs> There are two components to the Edward M. Kennedy Prize, a bursary award of $100,000 and a website created by Columbia University Center for New Media Teaching and Learning devoted to the prize-winning play accessible to teachers and students interested in an in-depth exploration of the play's content, subject matter, and production history. The Board of Governors of the Prize 
and wants to thank our distinguished our panel of distinguished judges, some of whom are here tonight, playwrights Chris Diaz, Rina Groff, Stephen Adley Gerges, and David Henry Wang, composer Gabriel Kahane, and book writer playwright John Weidman, Columbia U Pr University professor of English and Comparative Literature James Shapiro, Columbia University William B. Ranford professor of English and Comparative Literature and African American Studies Farah Jasmine Griffin, and Columbia University Dean of the School of the Arts, Carol Becker. A national network of 20 theater professionals selected five extraordinary plays to be finalists for the 2014 Kennedy Prize. They are Brandon Jacob Jenkins for Octoroon and Appropriate, Marcus Gardley for The House That Will Not Stand, Susan Laurie Parks for Father Comes Home from the War, parts, Wars Parts 1, 2, and 3, and Robert Schenken for The Great Society. The judges met on February 12th to select this year's prize recipient. Uh, I'd like to ask if Susan Laurie Parks to join Tony and me on the stage. <laughs> and first, I just want to say a word and thank Tony Kushner. He's made this all happen. Uh, now I'm going to read the judge's citation. The jury deeply admires all four of this year's nominated works and was struck by the fact that each in its own way addresses with eloquence and insight the as yet unhealed traumas brought on by the legacy of American slavery. From amongst this distinguished group, the jury awards the Edward M. Kennedy Prize for Drama inspired, inspired by American history to Father Comes Home from the Wars, parts one, two, and three by Suzanne Laurie Parks, the story of Hero, a slave, who chooses to fight on behalf of the, just a minute. Can you get this? Thank you. Uh, the Confederacy feels fresh and alive, shining new light on the complicated nature of freedom. In its, in, in its unflinching treatment of homecoming, betrayal, and heroism, Father Comes Home from the Wars announced itself as an iconic work that challenges and engages Western theatrical tradition while providing a compelling contribution to the urgent American conversation about race. Congratulations, Darren Laurie. Thank you. Just giving Susan Laurie uh, a fake check. The real one will be arriving in the mail. <laughs> and um, uh, the, every winner of the prize uh, receives a print of a specially commissioned uh, portrait of Ted Kennedy's sailboat by Jamie Wyeth. And so, oh, it's beautiful. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. I'm going to do an Elisa Solomon move here. This is awesome. I, 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 I wore this dress, and so. <laughs> <laughs> and they're filming, so I'm thinking, you know, like um, that wonderful show Hamilton down at the public. History has its eyes on you, and so I want to, I want to look good. Um, <laughs> I'm being silly. But I'd like, I'd like to thank the Senator Edward and Kennedy uh, Prize for honoring Father Comes Home from the Wars, parts one, two, and three. Um, thank all of you who, who made this decision. And among the generous judges, I see the faces of some of my dear friends. So that makes it very special. So thank you guys for thinking kindly of me. Um, I'm also very, very grateful uh, to Oscar Eustace and the Public Theater. And I, you know. <laughs> And, and your, your wonderful team, including Mandy Hackett, 
wonderful Mandy. I'm going to applaud. You don't know. Um, uh, if, 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 if you are in the trenches, call Mandy. I won't give out your number, but if you're a writer in the trenches, call Mandy and Maria Goyanis um, for helping me birth these, the first of these three plays of this nine-part cycle, which is called an Ennead. Nine things are an Ennead, which is... Now I gotta finish it, right? Um, an Ennead, and I'll, but I'll, I can gush on and on and on, but really, I cannot say enough... Um, I cannot thank you, Oscar, enough for your genius producing. Um, you, you promised we would make it there, and, and we got there because of, of you and your vision. Uh, your kindness, your smarts, you're just a joy to be around. And that day when I wanted to change the ending, when I ran it by Joe Bonnie, then I texted you and ran to your office out of our rehearsal to run it by Oscar, because I knew if Oscar said, yeah, try it then we were on the right track. So that kind of commitment and dedication and love, um, it trickles down, it comes, it flows down from you to your whole team at the Public Theater. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. In the house tonight, yes, yeah, so we can clap again for us. Thank you. No, you know, because we, we all know, you know, things don't, you know, it takes a team. Things don't just happen like that. Just isn't just the playwright or the composer or whatever. It takes a team and a great leader. In the house tonight is Diane Borger from ART. Um, thank you and your family at American Repertory Theater. I saw her somewhere. Ta-da, there you are. Yay, thank you guys. You guys are awesome for your love and support of this play. Joe Bonney, this is the first page is thank you. So Joe Bonney, uh, our brilliant director, I thank you. Um, just to give you guys a history, back in 2009, Joe Bonnie and I were having lunch, and I acted out the entire story of Father Comes Home from the Wars in between bites of food using the fork, the knife, and the spoon. So uh, luckily we, have, we, you know, we got some brilliant, fabulous, fantastic actors. Um, but um, the, the play, the first three plays, it would not be uh, so wonderful without your genius direction and your joy and enthusiasm and hard ass coolness, hard ass badassness um, that, that I so, so, so very much respect and appreciate. Um, also in the house tonight are wonderful, some of our wonderful, wonderful cast and crew. Um, I uh, came to every single rehearsal, which is, which, uh, is uh, well, in my history of theater, and I've been doing theater for 20, 30 years, it never happens. I never come to every single rehearsal and every show that I could possibly make, and it is because I just so loved being around you guys. I would just come and hang out, and sure it was nice to hear the play, but it was so wonderful just to sit in your company and your presence, and, and it's, so thank you, thank you, and it's just so great just to see you guys here. Yay, hi, Julian and PJ, guys, hey, Tony. Okay, <laughs> um, and a special thanks, you've already been recognized once, Mom, but why not again, to my dear, awesome mom, Mrs. Frances Parks. Um, thank you. In your footsteps, I follow. In your footsteps, I follow. And not only do you help me um, become a good mom in my own right, but you help me be a better citizen of the planet. Um, also, just a shout out to my son Durham, who is at home with the babysitter, probably watching soccer highlights on YouTube. So that's a good thing. But you know, scholars are just beginning to write and speak about Father Comes Home from the Wars. And I always see my work for, the, for over the years, I see myself as someone who, through theater, makes history. Because I have this sort of cockamamie belief that if it happens on stage, it really happened. So with my work, I work to fill the holes, the abysses, and create a wholeness. And Father Comes Home is a continuation of that work. I'm so uh, glad, you know, it's, so it's this, it's this enormous thing. For me, at the root of it, it's also a family play, a play about family. And it's a great honor that my family play, my play about family, is, has been recognized by the family of Senator Edward M. Kennedy. You guys have heard this many times before, but, um, well, your father, your brother's life of, of service, you, your family is one of the great beacons, one of the guiding lights to families like mine. We have been looking up to you guys and following you guys um, 
for so many years, and now we meet. And it's a great honor. It's a, it's a really great honor. Um, I wish Senator Kennedy were still here with us. Um, I wish my dad, who has passed away, was still here with us. Um, I wish everyone who we love and who is wonderful were still here. Um, but they go. And so, you know, here we are to continue, to continue on. Um, and then those we love will be proud of us for the way we keep on keeping on, as folks in the movement used to say. I started writing Father Comes Home from the Wars because of my dad. He was a career, he was a professor at the end of his life. But um, for 20 years, 25 years when I was growing up, he was a career army officer. ROTC, that was how the poor kids in his day also got into college. And so he joined um, the army uh, through officers training school right out of college. And he was a career army officer and a good part of my childhood was spent watching him go to war and come home. And we were lucky because he would go to war and come home. Um, go to war and come home again. On the day I was born, so the story goes, he was out in the field. That's what they call it when they go out into the field, the woods, and do army exercises. He was not behind a plow. That would have been very poetic. He was out in the field in a tank doing army exercises or war rehearsals. And if your life is a piece of music, and I believe my life is a piece of music, his going away to war and coming home again became the main groove of my record. And that's the main groove of what record plays in my head. Um, Father Comes Home from the Wars is also about the pursuit of freedom, and maybe it's also about the pursuit of happiness. Maybe those two things are connected. As you've heard, it takes place in the 1860s and features an enslaved people, the ruling class, the Civil War, uh, the battles are fought off stage, luckily for our budget, and... <laughs> right? I thought about that, yo, I thought about that. And um, it also, as you heard, features a talking dog, a dear dog who is faithful, who is full of faith, in a world where there is so much uncertainty. And all these characters are pursuing freedom. And near the end of part three, a wandering group of runaway slaves wonder about freedom. They wonder about the very thing they're risking their lives to obtain. And they say, the place I'm going to now is freedom. But where is freedom really? Will the air smell sweet? Will the streets be paved with gold? Will all in Freedomville welcome me with open arms? Will there be a bed to lay my freedom head? Will there be food? Freedom will burst my brains to madness, maybe. Maybe freedom will flood my heart to death. Will I say at the end of the day, God, I wish I'd stayed home. Well, I'm glad I didn't stay home tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you. So um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, Susan Laurie, that was astonishing. Um, and uh, uh, we'll hopefully see you uh, next year. Um, and uh, uh, there's a reception downstairs. So uh, please join us downstairs. And uh, thanks again. <laughs>